OK, so we're starting again a new module, so to speak. We're uh, moving from global spatial autocorrelation, which is the characterization of the full pattern, to the actual identification of clusters, the identification of, if you wish, special areas, areas that are somehow different from the other areas. And today, we'll take a statistical approach. Um, and then next week, we'll take uh, a slightly different approach, which is, comes from multivariate analysis. And since I'm assuming many of you ne don't necessarily have a background in that, I'll cover both the non-spatial clustering type of idea as well as the spatial type, which is called spatially constrained clustering. So that's for next week. This week, we go at this from a statistical point of view. And this is really two topics in one lecture. Um, you know, since it's a quarter, I have to kind of <coughs> squeeze a lot of stuff in here. And so the, the first part will talk about um, local indicators of spatial autocorrelation, which let us identify clusters statistically. And then in the second half, I'll talk about how to deal with the specific problem of rates or proportions. And I've already alluded to this earlier that rates are special because by construction, their variance is not constant or tends not to be constant when the population at risk varies a lot across the sample. So that violates one of the fundamental assumptions behind spatial autocorrelation analysis, not just the constant mean that we talked about, but also the constant variance. So <coughs> how do we deal with that? And so we'll look at a uh, couple of solutions. One uses the uh, Moran logic, but on a transformed variable. And the transformation supposedly corrects for the variance instability. And then the other two approaches are so-called scan statistics. And scan statistics are actually um, a very common type of statistic, not just in spatial analysis, but also in machine learning and in uh, multivariate analysis. So we'll just, again, give you a little sliver, a little taste of what this is about, and we don't really have time to dig into it. But I have uh, a couple of references here. So to start with uh, is my 1995 LISA paper, which kind of gives you the general idea of these local statistics. And then a fairly recent nice overview paper, especially the first half of it, is very useful. It shows you the different flavors of how one looks at this problem. And it talks about you know local spatial autocorrelation indices, uh, scan statistics, and also operations research inspired methods where you look at this idea of finding a cluster or determining a cluster as an application of integer programming. And we, we won't get into that. I'll just talk about it maybe one second uh, next week. But um, it's a very important literature. And then the additional material. Um, we will, in the lab, we'll be using yet another package uh, from our Epistat. Uh, I keep saying Epistat. It's spatial Epi. Uh, and um, for the scan statistics, there is a brand new package out with scan statistics in it. But you know, that's for next year. I won't try it this year yet. And then a couple of classic articles, the Basag and Newell one and the Kuldorf one are um, define these types of statistics that we'll talk about. Asunsaro and Reis uh, outline a way, one of the many ways in which you can standardize the rates and then apply uh, spatial autocorrelation statistics. And this is built into Geoda, so I'll talk about it. And then there's a, an interesting article that talks about how you deal with the multiple comparison problem, which is a real problem underlying the inference for both local spatial autocorrelation statistics and for the scan statistics. So basically, the idea is that the p-value that you get is not a proper reflection of the uncertainty in the analysis, because you do multiple tests on the same data. And whenever you do that, the p-value is affected by you doing multiple tests. And if you act as if this was just one and the only test, then you get a misleading sense of uh, precision or of uncertainty. The p-value is basically wrong. So you 
you think you have 0 0.01, but in fact you have 0 0.2, and it, it could be that dramatic. You know. So let's just start with the, the first um, submodule, so to speak, the principle behind these uh, <laughs> local indicators of spatial autocorrelation. And the big distinction I want to draw, and I pointed this out earlier as well, is a distinction between clustering and cluster. So what we've done so far, both with the global spatial autocorrelation measures, Moran's eye, Geary C, as well as with the variogram analysis, is characterize the pattern as a whole. And the null hypothesis is the same in all instances is spatial randomness, but we try to reject that in favor of positive or negative spatial autocorrelation, or a whole function, like the variogram is a whole function that characterizes the spatial uh, structure in the data. Here, we actually want to know where these clusters are. So we don't just want to know uh, this is not spatially random. There is structure in the data, but we want to know where is this structure? Where are these clusters? And this is, of course, very um, practical. That's really what you want to know. If you're going to intervene in, say, public health situations, you want to know where are the clusters of a particular disease. Just knowing that they're correlated isn't enough. You want to know specific location. So that's really what this is about. So the cluster detection literature, by the way, is huge, uh, much larger than I can cover even in a single course. And there are many, many different detection methods, some based on statistics, some based on optimization techniques. But the, the idea is always the same. We have to find the where. We have to find the location. And then, at least in the statistical approaches, we want to assess the uncertainty of that decision. So we want to measure significance in a quantifiable way. The uh, idea behind the LISA statistics is, is, is twofold. One is a local statistic. In other words, you have a statistic for each location. That's you know, basically what cluster detection is about. But the other one is a little more technical and actually has other purposes besides identifying clusters. That's a connection between a local statistic and a global statistic. And it's actually very simple algebra. And once you see it, you, you know, the light bulb should go off. You know, this makes a lot of sense. Not all local statistics actually are, strictly speaking, of the LISA kind, whereas they all satisfy the first requirement that they're location specific. They don't necessarily have a connection with a corresponding global statistic. And the reason why I find that connection at least useful, I'm not going to say important, but useful, is again in the spirit of assessing sensitivity. To what extent is our measure, we've already seen this a little bit in the Moran scatter plot, if you have these high leverage points, to what extent do they actually give you a potentially misleading measure of spatial autocorrelation because it's influenced by one or two points. And so the LISA approach allows you to formally decompose the global statistics, global statistic, into the contribution of every individual observation. And you can actually assess whether some observations or some subset of observation has a major influence, major leverage on the overall statistic, again, in the spirit of assessing sensitivity. So then, LISA analysis or local spatial autocorrelation analysis is uh, very important. How do we assess the significance of the statistic? It's one thing to compute a statistic for each location. It's another thing to be able to tell whether it's significant or not. And uh, that's particularly complicated because not only do we have multiple comparisons, which we'll talk about later, but also uh, we have to think about what is this p-value in the presence of global spatial autocorrelation. So our typical point of reference is spatial randomness. So when we talked about Moran's eye, the null was spatial randomness. Here, the null is local spatial randomness, which is not the same as global spatial randomness. So you can have, uh, especially once, once you walk away from this uniformity assumption and are interested in what we call spatial heterogeneity, then it's possible that sub -subset, some subsets of the data actually are spatially random and others are not. 
So the inference of the local statistic is uh, complicated by the fact that the local inference has to be made possibly in a context of not global spatial randomness, but existing global positive spatial autocorrelation. And so then you have to ask the question, to what extent is this local cluster that I find just kind of a byproduct of the fact that the data is globally spatial autocorrelated, or is it something with interest in and of itself? And, and that's a really tricky problem, actually. So the, once we have the statistic, we can compute it, assuming we get a p-value. Then we interpret it, and we interpret it uh, in terms of the classification of spatial autocorrelation that we saw earlier in the Moran scatter plot. Remember in the Moran scatter plot, we, went, we could separate out positive spatial autocorrelation, which was high, high, and low, low, and negative spatial autocorrelation, which was low, high, and high, and low. But we said in the scatter plot, as such, we can't really tell whether this is significant or not. So now we will be able to. So now we will assess the significance and then look at this classification and based on the classification, interpret the results either as clusters, hot spots or cold spots, that would be high, high, low, low, or this other notion of spatial outliers, which are locations that are surrounded by neighbors that are very different from the location. So it's a relative notion of outlier. It's not an absolute notion of outlier. And again, I, I need to stress this because it's easy to fall into the trap, you know, seeing high, high, low, low. It's all relative to the mean. So if the mean is high, then low, low may not be so low, right? If the mean is low, then high, high may not be so high. So it's always relative to the mean. This is particularly important if you do comparisons over time because in most instances, the mean will not be constant over time. So you need to take that into account when you uh, draw inferences. So then, uh, in general, there are many different uh, LISA statistics. Every global statistic that is decomposable has a local counterpart. And if you recall, uh, all the tests we've seen so far are double sums. Double sums over I and, and over J. You know, Moran's I was double sum I and J. Geary C was double sum I, J. So if you can separate this out and you have some kind of scaling factor, which I call A here, and then a sum of components that are specific to each location I, then that component is the local statistic. And then you see the connection immediately. I mean, in the simplest form, the global statistic is proportional to the sum of all the local statistics. And, and it's amazing how many statistics fall into this category because actually most of them, it's not. It's amazing, but it's not surprising because all of them have to do with pairs, you know, with relative uh, magnitudes. So um, it's not surprising. So, um, for example, the Moran's eye, we can, um, just a little bit of technical stuff, so we know that if you use row standardized weights, the ratio simplifies. The scaling factors you know, cancel out because they're both the number of observations, n in the numerator and in the denominator. So we do that just to keep life simple. And then we take the variables as deviations from the mean, or we could even standardize them fully. That is not really, uh, that is, if you do that, then it becomes even simpler. But basically, you can think of, uh, the local Moran's eye as this expression. And if you, um, M2 is basically the second moment, is the sum of squares. Remember, they're deviations from the mean, so that's the second moment. Um, and that's a constant, that because it sums over all the i, that doesn't change with each location. It's basically a scaling factor. So in other words, it's gonna be irrelevant when it comes to assessing significance. Because it, you know, whether you multiply something by two or not doesn't make any difference in terms of the significance, right? So this M factor you can forget about. So the, 
the main thing that matters is this cross product. And we've already seen this pro cross product in the Moran scatter plot, where we have the value at a location, z at i, and then the weighted average of the neighbors, which is the sum over j, there's no i in there, it's just j, the neighbors, of the weights times the value of the neighbors. And we know already that these weights are mostly zero, so we only do an average of the actual neighbors, and we take the cross product of that. That is the local statistic. And it's actually it's very simple, right? So the complicated part is, okay, we can compute this. How do we know whether this is significant or not? That's not that simple. And the um, other simple thing is the connection between the global and the local. Uh, so as, as you can see from here, if you take these individual uh, local Moran statistics and you add them up, then they're basically a multiple of the global statistic multiple by the size of the sample. So if you flip this around, then you see that in fact, formally, the global Moran's eye statistic is the average of all the local Moran's eye statistics. And then of course you can look at how is this average constructed. You know, averages, means, are very sensitive to outliers. That's why you do robust analysis with medians instead of means. So how do the outliers affect this averaging, which is your global spatial autocorrelation statistic? But that's just kind of more of a technical issue. What we're really interested in is, are these significant or not? And, and how do we do that? that? It's actually quite complex. You can do it analytical. Um, it's, first of all, it's very complicated, but also it's no good. So the... Um, analytical approximation by a normal distribution. It's, uh, we talked about this when we uh, discussed Moran's I and Geary C, where you, know, you have these two kinds of inference. One is analytical, the other one is computational. In the analytical, you have a null hypothesis, typically either standard normal variates, which are uncorrelated by definition, or uh, independent uh, equal probability kind of variates, and then Using that, you can figure out, well, what is the mean and what is the second moment or the third moment of this complex manipulation, which is basically a cross product between a random variable with that distribution and then a weighted sum of other random variables with that distribution. And that can all be done. In fact, it used to be the kind of assignments I got in my math stat class in grad school. That's the kind of thing you figure out analytically. But then the hard part is, okay, I have all these moments. What do I approximate this distribution by? And the typical solution in statistics and econometrics is to approximate it by a standard normal distribution or Gaussian distribution, right? Now, in the local case, this doesn't work very well. And uh, there isn't actually a formal proof of this, but my intuition is that in the local case, there's just not enough averaging going on uh, to approximate the asymptotic results. So asymptotic results are statistic, that's the mainstay of econometrics. That's the statistical results you get as the sample grows to infinity. But because we're working locally and we're working with a finite number of neighbors, this is not getting a denser and denser subsample. There's k neighbors and that's it. I, that's probably why the approximation doesn't work very well. Very easy to compute, and some software packages actually uh, produce that, but in my experience, it's very misleading. And actually, if you go back to the original paper, I actually show that it can be very misleading. So the way we solve this, again, as we often do, is computational. And we're going to go the permutation route. But now the question is, how do we do this permutation? Because before, it was the whole pattern. So we had all the data, we just we shuffled them and recomputed the Moran's eye, one Moran's eye. Now we don't have one Moran's eye, we have as many Moran's eyes as we have observations. Right? So how do we do this permutation? And, and technically this is called conditional permutation. So basically, it's a very simple principle, but 
implementing it efficiently computationally is, is another story. Right? So um, you take the value, let's say you think of this as a pot of values, right? And so we have n values in our sample. We have observation i, we take the value that we have as observation i, and we take that out of the pot. And then we sample k neighbors, k potential neighbors from the pot. So we pull out k values, and we compute the local Moran's i with the given z i. That one can't change. Okay, the neighbors change, but the z at i does not change. And we do that many times. That gives us our reference distribution. But a consequence of this is that we have to do this for every single observation. So this uh, scales up very quickly. And when you do this in practice, or like it's implemented in Geoda, you don't know this, but we under the hood parallelize this. Mm -hmm. And we take advantage of the multiple cores because this very quickly gets out of hand. If you do, you know, let's say you have 3,000 observations and you're going to do 9,999 you know, simulations for each of the 10,000, that's a lot of simulations. So uh, you have to think about this. Principle is very simple. You just do the same idea as what we've done all along, but locally. And so then, once we have this significance, we can map this. We can show the locations that are significant, and we can also show the pseudo p-value, remember this is not a real p-value, this is based on basically the tails of the reference distribution, so it's purely, it's data driven, so set the random seed, otherwise you can't replicate this, these are all the things we've been talking about. And um, you can map this, one golden rule, and I say this because I see the opposite way too many times in practice. Do not map the locations that are not significant. Just as we discussed earlier uh, with Moran's I and Geary C, if it's not significant, there is no point saying it's positive or negative. It's not. It's just spatially random. In the local case, that's even more important because it's very easy to map all the Moran's I's or the corresponding Z values, but it's highly misleading because only where they are not significant, do they actually bring something to the table? So when they're not significant, you don't map them. I mean, they're white or whatever. But of course, what is significant, that depends on the p-value that you pick. So one of the things we'll see in the lab in Geoda is that you can actually assess the sensitivity of the results to the p-value that you choose. And as we uh, know already, that p-value depends on how many permutations you carry out. So in this particular case, this is um, life expect, you know, the opposite of life expectancy, not expected to survive past 40. So the, the, these are the significant clusters. There's one big problem here, right? What's the problem? Okay, where are the hotspots? Where are the hotspots? No, you don't know. You just know it's significant. You don't know whether it's positive or negative or whether you know this is high, high or low, low. You don't know that. Right? So this is basically just because I have to talk about significance, but I never even look at this map. Right? I look at this map, the cluster map. That's the cluster map. So what the cluster map does is actually combine two things because they're so similar. We've already seen that the Moran scatter plot is basically the same magnitude, the zi and the sum of, of the weighted neighbors. We already have this classification of high, high, low, low. So we combine that with the significance indicated by the local spatial autocorrelation coefficient. And then we can say not only as we do here, this is significant, the white ones are not, but then we can say the significant ones are actually categorized into four groups, two big groups. Positive spatial autocorrelation are the clusters, and they split into high, high, and low, low. 
a negative spatial autocorrelation are the outliers, and they split into high-low and low-high. And we combine this classification with the significance. So first of all, we only show the ones that are significant at a particular p-level, and then we show how they break out in terms of high-high, low-low, and so on. So this is the same result as you saw before, but now it's actually meaningful. And you see that there is a cluster up on the north side of very low life expectancy. And similarly, there's a cluster in the middle of the country with above average, higher uh, life expectancy. Remember, this is the reverse, right? So high, high is bad, low, low is good uh, for this particular variable. And then we see these off-colored, I'm not going to uh, say what color this is because I'm always wrong anyway, but the bluish one and more the reddish one are the low high and high low uh, outliers. And one thing that you often see is that this is sensitive to the cutoff p-value that you use. So as we'll see in the lab in Geoda, you can change this. You can uh, change the, the cutoff p-value and the map below shows you if we take a, a little more stringent p-value at point z zero 0.01, then we see these clusters are shrinking. And oftentimes this happens, the outliers disappear. So uh, you'll see this in practice if you are, you know, 99 or it do doesn't really matter how many permutations you do. If you take a cutoff of 0 0.05, you get bigger blobs and you get the outliers. As you get, you tighten your p-values, the blobs shrink and the outliers mostly disappear. If they don't, then they're really interesting locations. Outliers are interesting because they're different from their neighbors. Right? So that suggests spatial heterogeneity. Something is different there from the rest of the pack. So this I call a local cluster map. This is my, um, of course, a little biased here my favorite device to do exploratory spatial data analysis. You crank these out, it's very easy to do in Geoda, and you literally start seeing connections between different variables in terms of where they cluster, where the high values cluster, where the low values cluster, to what extent do these clusters coincide or are very different in their location. It's, you know, it's a great initial shortcut to learn from the data. Um, and I've tried this in many different contexts with, you know, so-called domain experts and, you know, they are, their eyes go open when they start seeing these different patterns in the data. It's a really powerful device. Um, one of the issues related to this is what exactly is a cluster? And I just want to um, highlight this spatial outlier. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but you see this is a brown one, brownish one, surrounded by blue ones. So it is literally a spatial outlier. And to such an extent, and this is where the p-values come in, to such an extent that you would not expect this under unstructured, spati spatially random uh, setup. So the null hypothesis of spatial randomness. OK, as I mentioned, what is a cluster? So. Oftentimes, the uh, notion of a cluster is actually misinterpreted because these locations shown on the map are individual location-specific statistics that are significant. And because of the nature of the clustering in space, they tend to locate together. So then you tend to say this is a cluster. But actually, if you think about it, the cluster is about how similar a location is to its neighbors. So the neighbors in spirit are also part of the cluster. So if you want to be picky, then you would say, well, these red things are not actually the cluster. We also have to include the neighbors. And here's a little trick. So um, if you want to be picky, so we're going to be very picky, and we take a very tight uh, p-value, 0.001. So you see they're shrinking. They get smaller. But then we say, OK, sure, they're shrinking, but we really should include their neighbors. And so we include the neighbors. And then we're basically back where we started, right? 
with the neighbors included, with these bigger blocks. So it's not strictly correct, but it's a good rule of thumb, is that we basically don't have to worry about this. So if you want to be really strict and you have a p-value like 0 0.001, which will take care of enough, most multiple comparison problems, in fact, in practice, you, if you crank up the number of permutations, you can get this even smaller. So then the multiple comparison problem for all, pra I mean, not strictly speaking, of course, not mathematically, but in terms of qualitative conclusions is not going to matter. Uh, but then you, know, you also see that you don't necessarily have to do that because you basically find back the original larger cluster before it started shrinking with the p-values by adding back in the neighbors. So the, the notion of a cluster with a local autocorrelation statistic is the similarity of the value at the location with its neighbors. So the neighbors are actually part of the cluster. With a spatial outlier, that's not the case because that's why it's an outlier. It's not a cluster. It's different from the neighbors. So with an outlier, if you plot it on the map as a significant outlier, that's it. You don't need the neighbors. But if you define clusters, then you might want to include the neighbors. Of course, this all depends on what you're trying to do. If you use this primarily as an exploratory device, then you don't really have to worry about this. If you want to be very particular about what is a high elevation cholera incidence location, then you might want to think twice about, first of all, the p-value that you use and also how you define uh, the actual notion of a cluster. Because if you just look at the mapped locations, you're actually underbounding the actual size of the cluster. Okay. <coughs> Another one in this family is the G-statistic developed by uh, Geddes and Ord. And in a strict sense, it's not a least saying that it, there's no connection between a local global, but it is a useful statistic, as you'll see in a few minutes, is very similar um, in result to what the local Moran gives you. It's, of course, not similar in design. And uh, the local Moran and the Moran statistic is based on a cross-product logic. We've seen that before. We saw, for example, that Geary C and the variogram are based on the square difference logic. This uh, G-statistic is really based on a point pattern analysis lo logic. And we'll talk about point pattern in a couple of weeks. But basically, it came from looking at when you have a point, how many points can I expect under spatial randomness in a given circle around that point? And as we'll see in the point pattern analysis module, uh, that follows a Poisson distribution. So Poisson distribution is a distribution for counts of events. If you have a given mean, you can figure out what is the probability that I get zero, one, two, three events in a given area, right? And so that's where this statistic comes from, the logic of the statistic. But uh, its application to aerial data uh, is, is very simple. So it's a ratio uh, there's no cross products here. There's just summation, weighted sums. In fact, in its original form, it wasn't even weighted. It was just summing. The weights matrix was binary, so it was just adding up. Uh, the neighbors, and then scaling that by the sum of values. And the difference between the GI statistic and the GI star statistic is that GI is all except I itself. So it only takes the neighbors, and the denominator is the sum of all the values except the value at i. And then gi star includes, uh, let's skip it for a second, gi star includes the value at i. So what does that mean for the, numer uh, for the denominator? It's a sum over all the j's, no matter what the i is. So in other words, this is just a scaling factor. This is irrelevant for the statistical inference because it doesn't change. It's the same for every location i. What does change is the numerator. And what's very different here between this statistic and pretty much everything else we've done so far 
is that the location itself is included. Remember, weights matrix diagonal zero. So the location itself is not included. In the GI star statistic, that is not the case. So then we have to deal with how do we weight the value at the location relative to the value at the neighbors. Now, we've never had to deal with this. We say row standardizing. Row standardizing means all the neighbors get the same weight, but the location at I doesn't count, so it's not involved. But here, we have to make a decision. How do we weigh the value that we see at the location I relative to the value of the neighbor? So that's a practical consideration to take in, into account. So now we know the two statistics. Let's go back. Um, inference, same deal, right? Analytical, you can do it. And it's very complicated and it's not very reliable in terms of a, a standard normal approximation. So we do the same thing as for the local Moran. We do conditional permutation. Right? Uh, and we have the same kind of uh, maps. The significance map is good for, you know, if you want to see what's significant and what's not. But it doesn't tell you the type of uh, cluster that you get. And one big difference, major difference, between the, the G family of statistics and the Moran's I is that there's no local outliers. And the reason we can get local outliers in Moran's I is because it's a cross product statistic. You know, but these G statistics are basically summations. And they look at whether the sum scaled in some way is kind of larger than it should be or smaller than it should be. Right? Under spatial randomness, you can think of this sum should be pretty much, you know, randomly following some average. But if somehow it's way larger or way smaller, then you have a grouping of large values or a grouping of small values. And that's interpreted in the, in the G statistic terminology as a hot spot or a cold spot. So it's hot or cold. There's no spatial outliers. But as, you know, maybe you have a mental map of this, First of all, the difference between GI and GI star is minimal. I mean, I, in none of the examples that I use have I found a difference between the two. So it's very minimal. Uh, furthermore, so this is all the same stuff. You know, it all looks the same. Uh, there's hardly any difference between the G statistic and the local Moran. So as I mentioned, interpretation, same as before. Forget the non-significant ones, only the significant ones. Positive, hot spots, negative, cold spots. So very intuitive. In that sense, people um, like it a lot because it's just, instead of four categories, it's two categories. It's very simple. Uh, whether this is OK or not really depends on how much you care about spatial outliers. And if you don't care about them, then basically Moran, the local Moran and the GI statistics will give you very similar results. The, uh, so the comparison is, um, as I mentioned, when you don't care about outliers, then G statistic is fine. Um, when you do care about outliers, then it's not. But, um, and one drawback, which is, um, you know, uh, that was mentioned in the literature, is that the local Moran doesn't really tell you anything about the type of uh, Autocorrelation. The G statistic does. Positive, it's hot spot, negative, it's cold spots. But if you combine the local Moran statistic with the scatter plot, Moran scatter plot idea, then you actually have four classifications. So, you know, it's whatever is your uh, preference. And you see, typically you're going to get this kind of uh, result where, for all practical purposes, the same general shapes are identified by the two statistics. But the uh, G statistic, in this case the GI star statistic, tends to incorporate the outliers into the cluster. Okay. So, and as we saw before, as you crank up the p-value and make it more extreme, then oftentimes these outliers disappear, and then the, the results of the two approaches are basically the same. Okay. But it is a different logic. One um, kind of Side effect, you, this isn't really widely reported in the literature, but 
uh, I use it in, in Geoda, is that you can use the GI star statistic as sort of a local joint count statistic. So if you're interested in finding out how many ones surround a given one locally rather than globally as we did in the joint count, you can actually use the GI star statistic to do that with a little trickery, but it, it works. So three main issues. One I already mentioned, multiple comparisons, right? So uh, the significance level, either analytically or from the conditional permutation at any given location, assumes that basically that's all you're looking at. But in fact, you're not. You're looking at every single location, so the, um, the tests, so to speak, are correlated. They are not independent tests because they use overlapping parts of the data because you know, the neighbors keep overlapping. So strictly speaking, the individual p-values are incorrect. They will tend to be overly optimistic. So as I said, you get a p-value of 0.01. It's really not 0.01. It's, it's much higher. But So this is a problem. How do you correct for this? This is very tricky. So there are a number of corrections out there in the literature. Probably the best known one is Bonferroni bound. Um, you, you folks familiar with that? Now the problem with Bonferroni bounds is that you correct for the total number of comparisons. So if you do two or three tests, that's not a big deal. If you do 3,000, as in the case of the counties, that is a big deal. So basically the idea of the Bonferroni bound, it's a bound, it's not exact is you divide the target p-value by the number of comparisons. So if your target p-value is 0.05 and you do five comparisons, then in each individual test you, you use 0.01 instead of 0.05. Okay. If your target p-value is 0.05 and you do 3,000 comparisons, your individual p-value is something with a lot of zeros in front of it. So it's almost never going to happen. So is that correct? Well, it's a bound, right? It doesn't tell you that this is right. And, and there is really no formal, um, I mean, they're all bounds, but there's no formal result that says exactly what this p-value is. Uh, my intuition is that um, you can think of correcting by the average number of neighbors as kind of a guideline, but basically my recommendation is don't get too excited. You know. So if you have p-values of 0.05, don't get too excited. You know, if you have p-values of a bunch of zeros and then one, don't worry about it. Right? Because then, you know, even if you have, say, by the structure of the neighbors, six or seven or eight uh, multiple comparisons, you know, 0 0.0001, you're still going to be in, in, in good company no matter what, right? But if you're at the edge, then probably that p-value is misleading and tells you that something is a cluster that most likely is not really significant or definitely not at 0.05, you know, maybe at 0.10 or 0.15 or something like that. And so depending on what it is you're doing, this, you might want to take that into account. Uh, definitely, <coughs> The bottom line, cautious interpretation. As I said, don't get too excited. So then um, the second item is keep in mind this is exploratory. This doesn't explain anything. You know, sometimes people get carried away and do a whole bunch of these local cluster maps. Well, that's all fine, but what do you do now, right? And it's just a means. It's not an end by itself. And it's a means in just like any exploratory data analysis, it's a means in getting the light bulb to go off. You start, it suggests patterns, you know, IJ good, potentially explicable patterns, right? Something that you might want to include in a model. But the model is what explains, not these local cluster maps, right? So that's, um, and then of course we have our inverse problem that I've mentioned a couple of times now where, you know, it's about pattern, it's not about the process. And different processes, even completely different processes, can yield the same pattern. So 
the, that, that's always a challenge in this kind of analysis. And then finally, it's univariate. Keep that in mind. We'll do a little bit of multivariate next week, but uh, that's a whole other ball game. Everything gets much more complicated in the multivariate sphere. And these univariate analyses, they ignore multivariate interactions, but uh, by the same token, they also might suggest multivariate interactions. It all depends on how you use this. You know, if you, you know, kind of focus on one variable at a time, that's one thing, but if you kind of look at the, the you know, ensemble, as they call it, everything together, then you might start to see some patterning that might suggest multivariate relationships. And finally, not to be forgotten, uh, this is the one that bites us over and over, is the scale of analysis. So a scale mismatch can provide misleading impressions of clusters without something that's behind that that is actually meaningful. So the scale problem can be go both ways. You can be too close to the problem, and you know your spatial scale of analysis is too small, and then you might see these big blobs of clusters, but it's basically because you haven't moved away enough. Everything is the same locally, or you're too far out, and then you know you're also missing the actual processes that are going on. Okay, so that's the statistic. Well, no, they're both statistical approaches. That's the approach based on the spatial autocorrelation statistic, generically, for any kind of data. And now I'm going to move to the rates. And first, a little lesson in mathematical statistics. And I know for some of you this isn't necessary, but just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Because this kind of sneaks up on you, uh, if you don't think about it. And I know some of you already kind of ran into this when you did the exploratory analysis, is the difference between spatially extensive variables and spatially intensive variables. So essentially, a spatially extensive variable can be correlated with size. You know, if you look at the number of accidents by county, well, larger counties will have more accidents than smaller counties, everything else being the same. So that's not a good comparison. You have to scale it somehow that they all become comparable per capita, or as a density, or as a percentage, or as a proportion. And a proportion, or a rate, is typically the number of events over the population at risk. And it's really measured as a proxy for the underlying risk. Okay. So you want to know which route to take from wherever you live to school that minimizes the chance of you getting in a vehicle accident. Okay. How would you approach this? Well, you could just look at the routes and count the number of accidents as such. But that could be highly misleading because some routes are busier than others. So if you have a super busy route that has one accident versus a route where hardly anybody drives and it also has one accident, the risk is not the same. The risk is actually much higher in this emptier road. Right? So we need to take that into account. And so how do we measure risk properly? Typically, we take a, a baseline, population at risk it's called. It could be people, it could be cars, it could be you know, just about anything that makes sense as a denominator. Right? And then the numerator is the actual number of events. So we call this accrued rate is just simple ratio of the number of events over the population at risk. In demography, very often, and in epidemiology, you don't really care about the crude rate so much, but you change it into a relative rate, where something, theory, or the data gives you an expected number of events for each area. Say, if the risk were the same in all the counties in the country, how many homicides would you have in your county? And then rather than taking the number of homicides over the population of a county, you take the number of homicides in that county over what you would expect had the uniform risk throughout the nation applied to that county. And so it's kind of a ratio relative to one. You know, if it's larger than one, you have more homicides than based on the average of the country. If you have less than one, you have fewer. So that's just a technicality, basically. Everything that we talk about in terms of the raw rate transfers uh, readily to the uh, relative rate. 
So a little bit of math. This is a proportion. The numerator is a random variable, the number of events. Typically, we think of that as generated by a Poisson distribution of negative binomial or something like that. The denominator is not, is not random. The population at risk is basically, for all practical purposes, a constant. So what we need to figure out is what are the moments of this distribution, uh, of this random variable, which is the ratio of a count to a constant for all practical purposes. So we know our math stats. We know that the expected value of a random variable divided by a constant is the mean divided by that constant. And we know that for the variance, it's the square of the constant. So if we think of these um, events as drawn from a binomial distribution with a given probability, you know, so we have our VAT of white balls and red balls, and the red balls are homicides. So we just grab them and see how many we have based on the proportion of red balls in, in the VAT, and that's pi. So on average, we, we see that if we take P people, pi times P would be the number of events that we get. Right? And the variance, this is all standard stuff for binomial distribution, pi, one minus pi times the population. That's the numerator. What about the whole ratio? So P is just a constant, so good for us. The raw rate is actually an unbiased estimate for the underlying risk. So we're actually doing pretty good. We count the number of events. We divide it by the population at risk. That ratio <coughs> is an unbiased estimate of the underlying risk pi that we don't know. Unbiased, but unbiased isn't everything. right? As we know, there's this other thing called variance. The variance is a little more complicated, and you just divide it. You know, P is in the numerator, but P squared is in the denominator. So it's the pi, 1 minus pi, divided by P. So there's two special things to this variance. One is that the numerator depends on the mean. In standard linear statistics, we don't like that. Right? We separate the mean from the variability. They're separated. Now, in a lot of um, generalized linear models, for example, that's not the case. And there's a relationship between the mean and the variance. So this is one example where this is the case. Uh, basically, if you have a higher underlying, underlying risk, there will be also higher variability. And, but the most important one is the second one, is that this P is in the denominator. In other words, the variance depends inversely on the population. In other words, large populations, high precision, low populations, low precision. So you, you're trying to estimate the cancer of a, uh, the, the risk of a particular cancer, and you go to a city like Chicago, whatever, three, four million people, you have your number of cancer cases divided by four million you have your estimate. Or you go to some rural county, 300 people, you know, 10 cancer cases, that proportion is going to be an unbiased estimate of the underlying risk, but a very imprecise measure. And the case where this comes up the most is, for example, uh, homicides. There is obviously some national risk that anybody gets killed in a homicide, right? But if you go to some counties in the upper Midwest where they haven't had a homicide in 15, 20 years, what is the risk? Is it really zero? Or is it just the zero is an underestimate of the true risk because it's zero with a huge variance because there's only a handful of people that live there anyway. So that is what this is, uh, that is the problem. It's called variance instability of rates. It um, is very relevant in what we call small area analysis, which is a huge area of application in public health and criminology where you basically look at statistics at the small area level, but these areas don't have the same population. So if the populations are highly uneven, and that's a critical factor, 
Sometimes they're not. But if they're highly uneven, then we will have this variance instability, which defies one of our fundamental assumptions underlying the analysis, right? constant variance. Now, this is why agencies like CDC do not report disease rates at aerial scales smaller than a critical population. Now, the critical population depends on the agency. Sometimes it's 50,000, sometimes it's 200,000. But basically, if you have fewer people than that, they won't tell you what the rate is because the unreliability is too high. Right? But small area statisticians, you know, it's very frustrating. You know, if you say, I can only work with areas of 200,000 people or more, that cuts out a whole bunch of areas that I might be interested in. So how do we deal with this if we just kind of forget about this minimum threshold and we want to analyze even areas with very small numbers of people in them? And so there, um, I don't have time to talk about this, but there's a whole uh, suite of methods to so-called smooth the rates. And the idea is really a Bayesian idea. It's an idea of borrowing strength from other information. So in other words, uh, take my example again as a county in Minnesota, no homicides for the last five years, is the risk of homicide zero? Well, what we have there is all these national statistics or even statistics for the state of Minnesota that say, well, the risk of homicide is, you know, maybe half a percent. It's not zero. So what we do then is we say, well, this has some value. In the Bayesian uh, way of thinking about the world, this is prior information. Right? So I have my prior information, statewide risk, and I have what I measure in my county. So now I'm going to combine these two. And I'm going to combine them in a way that takes into account the precision of each of these measures. So if my county has very low precision, I'm basically going to borrow strength or I will shrink towards the prior, shrink towards this prior measure of risk. I'm going to say, I don't believe this zero business. I'm going to go with the state rate because it's more precise. But if your county is large enough, you know, Minneapolis, you don't care about the state rate because you have the precision right there. So that's the methodology of smoothing rates is shrinking them towards a reference value. And it's a whole bunch of technicalities related to that. Uh, this is an example of Nepal that I used, and you see there is a little bit of effect at the outliers. So if you think of shrinking towards the mean, then the extreme values, if they pertain to small areas, will be pulled within the fence of the box plot. And then some others, because everything changes, the variance changes, might be pushed. Oh, so at the margins, you see these effects, and typically that's how major it is. It's just at, at the margin. <clears throat> and then, um, so how do we deal with this for spatial autocorrelation? Because I just mentioned this variance instability violates one of our fundamental assumptions, so we're out of business. Well, maybe not, because one of the things we could do is standardize our raw rates, our crude rates, our proportions, so that this variance instability is gone. Remember, I alluded to this in the variogram approach. You know, we, we can deal with the detrending, but we haven't really done much about the variance. And what you can do about that is take a logarithm or take a square root to somehow try to standardize variance. This is very much the same idea, but it's a little more complicated in that the standardization will take into account the specific properties of these rates as binomial random variables. So we compute the mean and we compute the variance and then construct a standardized variant and then do Moran's eye on that and we're in business. So that's the first approach. So we standardize the um, variant and then the random variable and then carry out uh, local Moran or global Moran for that matter as if everything was fine. In fact, the local Moran implementation is specific to Geoda and to the work that we do. 
it was, the idea was originally developed for global Moran statistics. And then the other approach are the scan statistics. And the scan statistics, there's a whole world out there. That's a really big deal. In fact, uh, some public health agencies uh, designate scan statistics as best practice. So if you're going to do anything, do a scan statistic. There's downsides to that as well, as we'll mention in a few minutes. So first, the local Moran, we call it NGO, the EBI local Moran. Um, it's very tempting, and I see it all the time, when you deal with rates, to smooth the rates first and then carry out the spatial autocorrelation analysis. And that's a no-no. Okay. It's a no-no because the smoothing, many of the smoothing methods, not all, but most of the smoothing methods, introduce spatial correlation as a result of the smoothing. So then if you do that and you smooth the rates and then test for spatial autocorrelation, you don't really know what it is that you're getting. Are you getting back the autocorrelation that you actually put in by doing the smoothing or are you getting more and which part is due to what? And so generally don't do it, okay? If you have rates, uh, correct the rates first by means of this um, EBI standardization and build that into the Moran statistic explicitly. And there are a whole bunch of proposals in the literature. This has kind of died off a little bit because the uh, modern trend in this analysis is to do what is called model-based smoothing. And so none of this mechanical, like empirical based or spatial smoothing, but actually the variability of the rate is built into the model itself. And so then you can deal with that. Uh, uh, and that's basically how people do it nowadays. But in an exploratory sense, we have this uh, uh, EBI, empirical base index, uh, they call it in the literature. So it, it looks very complicated, but it's actually a very simple principle. We um, adjust for the variable variance specific to each observation. So it's not a smoothing, it's not a shrinking towards some common average, and then we just carry out Moran's eye as if nothing happened. So as I said, this looks very complicated, but it's all related to the overall average, so the sum of all the cases over the sum of all the population, and so on. If you have some time, you can look at this equation a little closer, but the bottom line, and I want to go a little faster because I want to spend some time on the scan statistics, is that this looks exactly like uh, everything we've done so far. And again, um, I've had to actually work really hard to get you an example where it makes a difference. Um, so in this case, you see up there, that's the Moran's eye, the local Moran applied to the crude rate, as if nothing happened. And then the bottom one is to the empirical base index. And there is one little difference. And that difference also tends to go away when you crank up the p-value, when you shrink the clusters, right? Um, should we not do this? Well, it all depends. The critical factor is how unequal are your populations at risk, right? So if they're not too unequal, this is not gonna matter too much, you know, because they're all going to have variable variances, but the variable variances will be all be more or less the same, so in the end it all washes out. But if you have for example, highly urban areas with lots of people in them and then rural areas with hardly anybody in them, this will be an issue. And it's an issue in that it um, identifies uh, false outliers, uh, spikes that really are only due to the uh, lack of people, basically, uh, and the huge variance that is associated with that. So if you think again of my Minnesota homicide example, you know, you have nothing's happening and all of a sudden in one year there's a family drama and four people get shot, right? That murder rate goes through the roof. So all of a sudden that is a high crime county. It is. This is just stuff that happens by the law of probabilities, but because you focus on such a small area, the effects of these actions happening 
really provide uh, false information. And this was actually very controversial. Uh, well, the whole thing was controversial, but one aspect of it was with the uh, identifying clusters of leukemia, a childhood leukemia, where uh, some of the criticism of the cluster detection was that it didn't properly take into account this small area problem of uneven populations at risk, and that some areas identified as high child leukemia hotspots were actually maybe not, because it was due to the higher variability in the measure. And so these are the kinds of things you have to watch out for. Okay, then the other way of dealing with this is totally different. Um, it um, doesn't deal with the ratio as such, only deals with it kind of later on in the analysis, but it deals with the counts. So the idea of a scan statistic is that you have kind of a scan, a shape, and then you count events within the shape. And typically the shape is a circle, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, there's a, a literature on extending this to ellipses or irregular shapes and so on. There's, there's, you know, there's actually a, a quite a literature on the scan statistic. But in its principle is you get a shape and you count how many events are in the shape. Right? And then you have to somehow figure out, do I have an elevated count in my shape? And if I have an elevated count, I call it a cluster. Right? So there's, an, as I said, many different ways of doing this. Uh, the easiest way is to take centroids of areas and just have a circle around it and count the number of events in the, in the circle. And I, I picked these two to illustrate two different ways of thinking about this. One um, focuses on the numerator, the other one on the denominator. So the BSAC Newell statistic is, is a famous statistic uh, in point pattern analysis, but can also be used in, in aerial units is basically you, you focus on an area and you have a circle that keeps growing and you count the number of events. So we count our homicides until we reach, say, 200 homicides, right? Then we stop, then we figure out how many people are in this area, how many people are in this camp. And what is the probability given that number of people and given the average risk of having homicide what is the probability of having 200 homicides in a population of that size? And if that probability is small enough, it's always the same thing. Then we reject the null. Then we say, oh, this is very different from the average risk. So then we call this a cluster. Right? And we'll see in a second some side effects of this. But the, the rationale, that's basically it. Then the Kolderf scan statistic, which is by far the more, the better known and more used statistic. And in fact, there's a uh, software package, SatScan, I believe it's SatScan, which has been distributed by, um, I think, NIJ or CDC. Um, it's, and it's been uh, mimicked in R as open source counterpart. So uh, it takes the other approach. It, it counts until you cert reach a certain size of the denominator. So now we're not counting the homicides, but we're counting the people in the county. And then once we reach, let's say, 200,000 people, then we see how many homicides are. And then we compare, actually, that proportion relative to the outsiders. So it's, it's not this Poisson assumption of a given intensity, but it's in versus out. And it's a likelihood ratio. So if that is high enough, then we say, okay, we have a cluster. So it's, both of them are approach the problem, but one goes at the numerator, the other one goes at the denominator. So Visak Newell, so we just start, and we can start in any county, and we start growing our circle. We stop at a number of events, that is up to you. That is one of the variables that you manipulate. So that's domain specific. You know, if you're looking at homicides versus cholera cases versus leukemia, 
I mean, what is a large number of cases? It depends on the, on the field. But basically, you keep growing the circle. And when you hit your number, then you do your hypothesis test. And you have a p-value. And here's the problem. You do this many times. So we have our multiple comparison problem back. And so we can have m multiple of these areas, each with their p-values. And then we rank them. So we have the one with the very smallest p-value, and that's our most important cluster. And then we have the second smallest p-value, and that's our second most important cluster. So you can go on. You say, well, I want all the ones that are more significant than 0.05. You might end up with 50 clusters. Right? And moreover, they tend to overlap. Mm -hmm. So the same county can be in more than one cluster, which is a little disconcerting, but it's not actually, if you think about it, what, what it is that this procedure does. So it's just, uh, you typically take centroids, you sort the neighbors, nearest neighbor first, mm -hmm. and just keep adding until you hit the, the magic number. Then you do your Poisson test, which is very straightforward to do, and you get your p-value. And then you move to another one and do it again. Right? And so then you get these clusters, and uh, this is for the same... Um, data, the same um, data as, as here, um, as for the EBI statistics. So this was the, uh, I mean, it's not a perfect example, but this is schools per population example. So the EBI statistic, just give, get yourself a mental image. You have this little blob up in the middle in the north, and then the one with the cold spots in the southern part. So. Um, a little, uh, at least at first sight, potentially disconcerting is that um, this doesn't look like that at all. Right. So the first cluster, the most significant cluster in BSEC Newell, basically has nothing to do with what we found in this other technique. The second one actually does somewhat overlap. And, and why is this, you might say? Well, it's because it's a totally different logic. Now remember the local Moran's eye is a cross-product statistic. This is not cross-producting anything. It's just basically putting a mask over your data, counting numerator, counting denominator, and doing a Poisson test. You know, is this following? So you, you take the, the average intensity is adding, say, in our homicide example, adding all the homicides, that's the numerator, and all the people, that's the denominator. That ratio is the mean of the Poisson distribution. So then you figure out, given that mean, what is the probability that I have five homicides in my, in my cluster? In my, you know, uh, if five is my magic number, what is the probability, given the people in here and the five homicides, that this follows the average? And if it doesn't, I call it a cluster. As a result, Depending on what your magic number is, some of your cluster could consist of one spatial unit, which is never the case in the Moran's eye logic because it's a unit and it's neighbors. Mm -hmm. right? So it's never just one unit. So you could, um, and this is actually very typical of the scan statistic, that the most important, uh, not this one, the Kulldorff one, uh, the most important cluster is just a single county. And, and because that county, given the, the averages, has more cases than you would expect uh, randomly, right? which is a different logic, a different way of thinking about it than in the correlation statistics, which are all about even the G statistic. It's all about a location relative to its name. So that's BSAC Newell. It's always the same thing. You know, watch out with the p-value, multiple comparison. These are sequential tests. There's lots of literature about how you might fix this or at least correct for some of it. None of this is perfect. It's all exploratory. Just keep that in mind. And somewhat disconcerting is that these clusters can be overlapping. But then again, this is really about finding patterns in the data. So if you find these clusters, even though they are overlapping, what they tell you is that's what hap that 
what's happening in those locations doesn't conform to the overall pattern. And that, in a pattern recognition logic, is important information. Right? So then, Kulldorff scan uh, statistic, I kept it to the last, but it's probably the most important one in terms of use. Um, it's the, uh, so it doesn't focus on the numerator, it focuses on the denominator. And also, it's a likelihood ratio. There's all actually two parts to the Kulldorff scan logic. One is the likelihood ratio test, which basically, uh, formally, it's here. So you see this inside versus outside ratio of observed versus expected. And whichever is the largest has the large, uh, you can th think of it as the largest disconnect with the assumption of similarity everywhere. So you pick the one that has the largest disconnect, and that is your primary cluster number one. Right. Then, how do you know how significant this is? And that's another ballgame. And, and again, we're back to our backup, which is computational. You know, analytically, this is way too complicated to figure out. So we just shuffle things around and do this many times and compare the reference distribution likelihood ratios that we get to the one that we actually observe for the data, and it's always the same logic. So that's then the p-value that's reported in the scan statistics. And so, um, again, it's the same logic. You grow the circle or the ellipse or whatever shape it is until you hit your target value, which of course you de determine. And again, that's domain specific. Then you do this likelihood ratio statistic to pick out which ones are clusters, and they could very well be a single county, and then you get the p-value from the randomization. What are, uh, you know, this one is even stranger. So the first cluster has absolutely nothing to do with either one of them, right? It's not what we found in the EBI index, and it's not what we find in VSEC Newell. Um, the second one, a little bit more. So how do you use this? This really focuses your, your attention. Why would it pick up this area where clearly there is something going on that doesn't match the overall e equality assumption? And that, you know, that's where you move forward and start looking for um, other variables and po possible interrelations. So um, most likely cluster has the highest likelihood ratio. You get the p-value from the Monte Carlo simulations and you rank them and it, we have the same problems, multiple comparison, sequential testing. There is literature on there on how you might correct for this and so on. There's a whole bunch of technical issues associated with scan statistics. But scan statistics are actually very general. You know, This is a spatial one, but you can think of the same thing in multivariate space where you, you know, grow some kind of sphere and look at what this in the sphere and to what extent this is different from what you would expect to be in the sphere. Mm -hmm. So it's a very general principle here applied to a spatial context. So that's where I'm going to leave it today.